Good morning, everybody. Uh, so my name is Elizabeth Littlefield, and I'm with the Overseas Private Investment Corporation, which is the U.S. government's development finance institution. And I'm going to give you a few, a few opening remarks, and then we're going to turn to this uh, fabulous panel we have uh, with us this morning. So first and foremost, I think everybody in this room knows three big facts about global energy and the environment. Everybody here. First, this generation is indeed the last best hope to bend that curve of climate change in order to stop, both to stop catastrophic climate change and to solve energy poverty, and we can do both at the same time. Second, the emerging markets are really the ones that are leading the way in transforming their energy mix, scaling up, leapfrogging. Um, 90 or more countries now in the emerging markets now have explicit renewable energy targets. Did you guys know that Africa actually added more renewable energy in 2014 than in the previous 14 years combined? And that last year, more investment capital, almost more investment capital, flowed into developing countries' renewable energy programs than in the developed world. And then the third thing is that, of course, building out uh, renewable energy and addressing energy poverty will require, of course, many energy sources, many business models, both on-grid and off-grid. Uh, and, and, but one thing, of course, is absolutely certain. None of this can happen at all without, of course, the private sector, businesses like the leaders we have on this panel and in the room. And for the most part, the private sector is not going to fully engage without the support of the public sector to provide financing, mitigate risk, and provide the conducive business environment that's necessary for investment capital to flow. That's exactly what OPIC's uh, role is and why I'm so privileged to be on uh, offering opening remarks this morning and to moderate this terrific panel. Um, as the U.S. government's development finance institution, OPIC's role is to catalyze private sector capital to address development challenges in developing countries, and in so doing, of course, to advance our foreign policy and our national security interests, as well as make the world a safer and more secure place. We uh, at OPIC established renewable resources as our number one priority in 2010, and then drove our portfolio to grow tenfold from then, probably in 2009, tenfold in three years, and it stayed steady at about a billion dollars a year in, in financing commitments ever since. This has included many, many projects of many of you in the room, wind, solar, run of the river hydro, geothermal, even biogas throughout the world in Africa, the Middle East, Latin America, and in Asia. That we've seen such tremendous growth is testament, of course, to the increasingly strong business case for investing in renewable energy and to the pioneering work of so many people like the leaders we have with us today. The entrepreneurs on this panel um, are the visionaries, the implementers, and the risk takers. Now, we know that investors and capital markets can be ruthless and impatient. We also know that the short-termism of quarterly financial results and political cycles and investor rewards and punishments is the enemy of the long-term decision-making that's necessary for sustainable development and the stewardship of our planet. But you all are in it for the long haul, and it's a privilege for OPEC to be a partner of yours for the long haul as well. President Obama, as well, of course, as Secretary Kerry, uh, shares your vision and sense of urgency about the need for power in developing countries and to address energy poverty, especially in Africa. This was the impetus behind President Obama's Power Africa initiative, which aims to double access to clean power, cleaner power on the continent. You know, few things could be more important in creating that just and secure world that Secretary Kerry spoke about. 1.3 billion people in the world, that's five times the population of the U.S., lack the privilege of flipping on a light switch, reading after dark, or keeping perishables cool in a refrigerator things that we take for granted that we do every single day. That's 1.3 billion people with every single bit the human potential, the hopes and dreams of you and I. And it is for this reason that I am happy to report to you today, and you're the first audience to hear it, um, that OPIC has just last week met its original 
$1.5 billion commitment to Power Africa a full three years early, and we are definitely going to double down. We So we welcome the chance to do that with all of you here in the room today, uh, both in the U.S. and across the developing world. And with that, I'd like to turn to the introduction of our fabulous uh, panelists. David Crane um, is the CEO of NRG, which of course is a Fortune 200 company and one of the largest energy producers in the U.S. NRG, NRG open, uh, owns a diverse mix from gas to renewables of about 150 generation assets with a total capacity of 50 gigawatts that can cover about a, a third of the U.S. What you may not know about David, however, is that his entire family are fearless and avid outdoorsmen. And in fact, whilst uh, rafting in whitewater rapids, class five rapids, David has been known to leap out of his raft, grab a person in the raft next door and try to pull them in the water. You also may not know that David's leadership spans many sectors. In fact, indeed, he started uh, his career by owning a pizzeria and a discotheque in Hong Kong. Is that true, David? Yeah, what else? <laughs> I'll stop there. I don't know where you're getting this, but it's accurate so far. <laughs> uh, exactly. Um, Ahmad Chatila is the CEO of Sun Edison, which is, of course, one of the largest purely renewable energy develop uh, developers and IPPs in the world. The company uh, expects to construct over about three gigawatts of, power of renewable energy by the end of 2016. And what you may not know about Ahmad, of course, is that he started his career in a very unlikely place uh, in a liquor store in Tucson, Arizona. <laughs> Xavier uh, Hel Helgeson is the CEO and co-founder of Off Grid Electric, which is an exciting small business uh, providing solar home systems to customers on a really innovative lease-to-own basis for about the same amount of payment every day that they currently spend on kerosene and candles. They're operating right now in Tanzania and Rwanda and are hoping to expand to additional countries. What you probably don't know about Xavier is that he was actually five years ahead of Mark Zuckerberg in founding a Facebook-like website that was briefly the most popular college website in the country in 1999. Before it crashed and burned. Before it crashed and burned, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Indipreet Wadwa is the CEO of Azure Power, which is a highly successful company that started with $80,000 of his own money and went on to develop India's first ever grid-connected solar power in 2009. Um, he basically started the whole solar revolution in that country. Um, Azure has now built about 700 megawatts in the country and has, under, or has built or has in construction about 700 megawatts and another 1,000 in the pipeline. He actually started his career inspired by by Al Gore, and one of the interesting things that you may not know about uh, about Interpreet is he walks the talk because even though he's a Californian, he doesn't even own a car, which I think is very powerful. And also, he deserves a warm round of applause as we sit down and shift to the questions because he got married on Friday. So with that, gentlemen, um, let's let's um, shift to some some questions. And I'd like to start by just asking all of you, you know, when you look back over the last five years, nobody would have expected solar PV to be where it is today in terms of prices. So in your last five years and the work that you're doing, what's, what was the biggest surprise that happened to you in your business? David, should we start with you? Well, I, I think, and I, I should just say, since it's important in this international audience to sort of tell people, you know, where they're starting from apart from the discotheque in Hong Kong thing, um, is that, I mean, my comments are going to be mainly American-based because we're basically a U.S. Uh, company. And I would say by far uh, the biggest change, if, you, if, I, if I take a little license with the five years, is the is the drop in the price of natural gas in the United States because the price of natural gas informs in electricity prices. And the uh, in, in price of natural gas peaked on June 30th, 2008 at $8.95 per million BTU. And now it's $3 uh, per million BTU. And there's not a single human being alive that predicted that over the last six and a half years. And, and, th and that basically affects everything in our system and I would say that the most important thing it affects, if you look at it from a broad base, is everyone that exists in the American energy sector, you know, is a 20 or 30 year veteran at the top of these companies, you know, uh, began and, and had their career in a period of relative energy scarcity. 
but now in the United States, we, we live in, a, in an era of total energy abundance. And that means that if you want to actually make money as capitalists in an energy system, you, you have to find something to do other than just to sell BTUs. Uh, and and so, uh, so that's, to me, the biggest change in the last Great. five years. Thank you. Indeed, nobody would have predicted. <laughs> no. Indipreet, your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think um, the biggest uh, surprise for, for me was we, when I started the business, you have to be extremely aggressive with uh, your investors on the plans that you're going to hit. And I had forecasted a 40% um, movement on price of energy from solar systems over a five-year period. And we've been able to actually record 70% against that aggressive uh, target. So the improvement in the efficiency of technology and the capital cost have been far more um, aggressive than even you know a startup would have forecasted many, many years ago. And that actually opens up a lot larger market from a growth standpoint for us and for other companies in the sector. That's great. What about you, Anand? Well, look, um, thank you, first of all, for this. Uh, great to be here. I worked in semiconductors for 18 years before, so from a technology roadmap, I'm used to these kind of accelerated uh, cost reductions. So I wasn't surprised. Uh, actually, my view from day one, it will happen. Mm -hmm. But my surprise was the volume. In 2009, the worldwide demand for solar PV was 5 gigawatts. Today is 55 this year. And I don't see any time soon uh, that uh, scale not rising over the next five years. So that was the biggest surprise. Um, so if you think about the worldwide investments in technology, I guess nothing should be surprising in terms of Oh, no, because uh, all these costs have, are, they have to be done bottom up. Mm -hmm. And and you you go through. I'll give you an example. We used to buy a tracker that tracks the sun and produces 20% more production for 43 cents a watt. Mm -hmm. And today the pricing is around 15 cents. We could probably can make it for eight or nine cents. And I we see a roadmap to seven cents. Mm -hmm. So all of a sudden, not you're reducing something by five x over a six year period. That's amazing. Same thing with um, all pieces of the value chain, albeit the polysilicon that you use, the wafering, so on and so forth. What's happened to the, your, the, the price of solar for you in the last five, 10 years? Yeah, well, when, when in 2009, probably the price of solar average for utility scale around the world, there's varying cost of death and so on and so forth. It's probably 25 cents, 30 cents a kilowatt hour. Today, it's around six cents, right. and we see that to go down in the future. Right. Great. What about you, Xavier? Well, Elizabeth, in our, our business is a little different since we are, um, we're selling directly to customers who are not on the grid. So we're not only providing power, we have to provide storage and we have to provide end use of power. So the biggest surprise to me has been the reduction in the cost of LEDs, uh, the cost of lithium batteries, uh, along with the cost of solar. And it's really that multiplier effect. You know, if you think of an LED as five or ten times more efficient than a compact fluorescent light bulb. And then you think of the cost of solar coming down, 70%. The multiplier there is 15, in terms of the light that people get for the amount of money they spend. So uh, I think for us, that's, that's been incredible. And probably the trend that's gone along with it, which again is, is specific to, you know, to our company, or our, our kinds of models, is the rise of mobile money uh, throughout the uh, emerging markets and developing world where now someone deep in a, in a rural village can electronically send payment for a service. And that fundamentally changes the world in, in a lot of ways that we've just begun to, to learn about and explore. So would, would you say that the ability to, to in a cost-effective way, make those payments is what made off-grid investments a, an investable asset now? It's, it's more fundamental than the solar and the, and the batteries, to be honest. If, if we had to have, you can just imagine, if we had to have people go around and collect door to door, um, and I know this because this is how we beta tested the model, was, was to do it, <laughs> and it wasn't, uh, it wasn't easy. And these, these were people in a very constrained geographic range. And so, um, you know, we have an incredible amount of customers already in Tanzania, the first country we're proving this model, just electronically sending payment automatically. And that reduces the, f the transaction costs. Um, I, you know, I used to be in e-commerce, and um, one thing people don't realize is, is the merchant takes the risk. So if you, if you buy something with your Visa card, the merchant has to verify this is real. Visa doesn't take that risk. Well, with mobile money, we actually don't have that. When we get a payment from the customer, 
there is no fraud. We, we know the money's good, we know it's already there. And so it's actually cheaper and safer to accept mobile money payments from a Tanzanian villager than it is um, a visa payment from an, from an American e-commerce consumer. You know, Xavier, while, while you're on it, maybe you could just share with people exactly how your business model works. So I'm a, I'm a poor villager and I'm sitting in my, in my little house and you come along and try to sell me what your product is. What does it look like? Uh, that's, that's a great question, Elizabeth. So first thing I'd probably ask you is what you're already spending. Right. So I bet um, because you don't have electricity in your house, you um, have a kerosene lantern. It's, you know, it, it's uh, not the greatest solution, but it produces a bit of light. And what you probably spend is, say, 7 to $10 a month just on this. Well, then you have the annoyance of going to charge your phone because you don't, can't charge your phone in your house, but almost everybody has a phone. So you probably walk two miles, pay someone, leave the phone there all day. You can't get calls. You can't do business. You can't call your friends. Well, you, it's left there. Go back and pick it up. So you probably spend another five bucks a month on that. You probably listen to the radio. So you buy disposable batteries every week and put those in and then throw those away. Probably spend another five bucks on that. Mm -hmm. So our, our offer to you is, wouldn't it be great if you could do all those things starting today with almost no upfront cost? And you could pay as little as $6 a month to do all those things in your home. But not only that, but do them far, far better. Uh, and if you want to pay a bit more and power a, a laptop computer or a television, um, a bit more powerful stuff, uh, power your small business, we, we can do that for you too. Mm. Thank you. It's, you know, it's been interesting to see, uh, actually all of you gentlemen, even though many of you started on the grid-connected utility scale end of the spectrum, have recently started initiatives in off-grid. Interpreet, I know you're looking at that on a cash basis. I know Ahmad Sun Edison is doing a lot of exciting things in the off-grid sector, and David, I've heard you talk about getting a solar panel on the roof of uh, every house in the country. So if you're looking ahead to the 1.3 billion people that have no access to any power at all, and the 1.3 additional people that have only unreliable access in the planet, what do you think the balance is gonna be between people that are getting their power, both in the US and abroad, from a grid, electrical grid, versus a solar panel or some other kind of self-contained renewable energy system? Anyone? Well, I mean, I, I would say I, I think it's it's a it's a very different uh, analysis, um, and you know everyone's making the analogy for you know to cell phone usage, you know, uh, skipping the leapfrogging the uh, fixed line, you know, for countries which have the misfortune of not having a modern infrastructure, but they have the good fortune of not having an infrastructure that's about to be obsolete, so they mm -hmm. can just go to what makes sense, which is a more distributed, cleaner more resilient model and so if you're talking about the 1.3 billion that have no access and the 1.3 billion that have limited or I, I'm not sure what the definition is I mean I think that you know it's it's essential on every level that uh, that 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 those places don't duplicate you know the mar what we did at the you know in mm -hmm. this country and other developed countries in terms of, um, you know, create the grid-based uh, fossil fuel centralized system model, which economically doesn't make sense with solar power being where, where mm -hmm. the price is and where batteries are about to go. I think in the United States, you know, where you already have a trillion dollars invested in the grid-based system, I think it's, it becomes much more of a, of a, a mixed model, mm -hmm. you know, going forward. But, on the subject of how do you get to the 1.3 billion, I always thought that, and Xavier may have a different point of view since he's on the ground in Tanzania, but I always thought that the problem we have in the electricity sector is is we're just in an enabling function. You know, no one, even you know, as the CEO of an electricity company, I don't wake up in the morning and say I can't wait to use electricity <laughs> today. You know, I wake up and I want to turn the lights on or I want to do something else, and so. I always thought to get a quick penetration, you would have to tie uh, electricity and the distributed and the developing world to, to something that people actually want, mm -hmm. which is you know either communication, so cell phones, or to connectivity, or both, and 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 you'll get mass penetration there because I mean right now there there are more cell phones on the face of the earth than there are human beings. Uh, uh, I think that the economist tells us that we passed that. Mm -hmm. I think seven billion or eight billion cell phones in mm -hmm. usage around the around the world. So I think that's what's going to cause uh, the the quickest. Uh, and you also solve the payment question with that. So I, I think that's what's going to happen and needs to happen. Well, uh, just just to add to that point, uh, most of our customers tell us that phone charging is number one and lights are number two. 
so they'll actually yeah, they'll I, actually sacrifice the lights if they have to, but the I phone mean, charging I, is, is essential. Yeah. I mean, I actually had that epiphany uh, during Superstorm Sandy. You know, where, you know, everyone saw, I live in New Jersey, and everyone saw Superstorm Sandy. We had three days to prepare, and we prepared as everyone has prepared since time immemorial. Like, we filled the bathtub with water. We got all the flashlights out. And, you know, two days into Superstorm Sandy, you found out that lighting is the least of your problems with electricity. It's connectivity. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, I don't, I, I guess I'm just dim. It took me so long to figure that out. But, I mean, the days that electricity is associated with lighting, it's really not anymore. It's, it's connected to... Uh, Keeping people connected. So, Ahmad or Indrapreet, what do you, what do you, how do you see the balance? I mean, India is. A yeah, I think uh, a big part of the 1.3 billion people you mentioned are in Africa and, and India, and uh, there are a lot of grassroots efforts, uh, like what Xavier and, and others are doing in that space. But I, I still feel we we lack a scalable and sustainable business model in the off-grid market. So there are lots of smaller opportunities that are being aggregated by a lot of different players. So I think from a from a opportunity standpoint, in the next five years, you're talking about another trillion dollar of investment in these off-grid systems if you want to electrify every household and, and provide that energy. There is a little bit of more regulation required, a clear understanding of investment required, how to finance at large scale, how to interconnect with the grid infrastructure when the grid infrastructure comes out. Mm -hmm. And of course, then the payment uh, behind these systems that can give you a shorter payback. So I believe as the prices will continue to drop, you will get to a point where your payback is three to four years. You would not hesitate in making large scale investments. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a huge push, at least in India, in terms of electrification of every household by 2019. So you will see a lot of the policies emerge, a lot of capital structure emerge behind these scenes to have a lot of microgrids delivered very, very quickly, mm -hmm. where the traditional you know, infrastructure for transmission will take years to come up. So I think those challenges are extremely important to address from a regulatory, from a finance standpoint, to really scale at a, at a large scale. Mm -hmm. Amar well, look, I, I agree with what was said so far. I would say that also there's a tipping point where the numbers can skyrocket like to an extreme level. Because if you look at the battery storage cost roadmap and, and solar, you can really unplug homes from the grid by 2020 for $27,000. For $27,000, you can pay a couple of hundred dollars a month if you don't want to pay it all up front. And 10 years beyond that, you'll do it for $13,000. So I think that is going to happen in a way that might disrupt everything that we know. And the same thing in, in rural uh, electrification. There's today a little bit of a false choice where people think that an economy can only grow if you give them cheap cost of energy, which is fossil fuel, mm -hmm. versus doing a solar battery solution like Xavier is doing. And I think that's a false choice because what we're going to find is that cost is going to be so much lower from a business model perspective if the governments give a little bit of concessions so that no one undercuts that investment, I think you're going to find uh, the volumes there to be much higher, mm -hmm. much higher than we, we expected. So something's going to evolve over the next two to three years where business models become a little bit more fine-tuned and more talent come to the market and the cost roadmaps continue to decline where things can change in a, in a big way. Uh, think about it this way. When, when you hold an iPhone, five years ago, you know that the world has changed. It's not the same versus a BlackBerry. And I think, from, and, and it took a while for the iPhone to come. If you have worked in Silicon Valley, you know that video conferencing through phone is gonna happen. I worked in a company where we did the iPod um, uh, track wheel as well as the touch. Mm -hmm. So you can see all these technologies coming. At some point, one company goes and says, I have it. And I think in, in, in storage plus solar, unplugging homes from the grid or intense acceleration of rural electrification might happen. Interesting. Now, you, um, Sun Edison has been exploring beyond, going beyond solar. I know we're talking a lot about solar, and certainly that's where a lot of the growth has been in recent years. But tell us about your thoughts of other, of other energy sources. Why are you looking at the wind sector? What are you most excited about there? 
Well, well, let me step back and say that Sanadesan develops solutions. We're not technology bigots. It's not like I love solar for the sake of solar. We have to do something that makes sense. And wind actually is very exciting uh, because the, already the cost is low. It's not in every region, but in most regions. And there's continue to be learning over the next decade or more in that regard. So already you have a low cost solution that's gonna become even more competitive as time progress. And those uh, solutions are driven by companies that are world class. I mean, the CEO of Vestas is here, Anders. I mean, these are world class companies that will really deliver uh, over time. And if you look actually at wind for us as a solution, the, the generation time is different than solar. So as a mix in a country, it makes a lot of sense in Chile, mm -hmm. in India, in the United States. So, so it, it gives a more balanced generation uh, in a given country, which we like. Other thoughts on other energy sources? David? Well, I mean, just to offer a little bit of a difference of opinion. I mean, I'm not, I'm not as uh, bullish on wind, and um, even though we own a couple thousand megawatts of wind, but I mean, to me, we actually started when we sort of uh, diversified into renewables to do wind first because it is the cheapest form of renewable energy, but it's completely dependent on the grid. And so, I mean, because the only way wind gets cheap is by making bigger and bigger wind turbines. Mm -hmm. I mean, the wind industry, uh, and you know, this. I didn't learn this in law school, but I mean, converting kinetic energy into electric energy, it seems to be a brute force thing. So you gotta get bigger and bigger, which takes you further and further away from, from load centers. But it also, and it makes you basically dependent in the United States and most countries on, on companies that control part of the system that don't want you to succeed. Right. Um, and so, uh, so I, I, I always say to people, you know, not all renewables are created equal. There's a reason that solar is the most important, and, and I, you know, and you, you're trying to get the question away from solar. But uh, we live in a wireless world, and um, we totally live in a wireless world. And if, if the electric industry thinks that the only part of the world that's going to continue to be, you know, connected to a wire, you know, is it, then you know, then the electric industry is on a path that. Uh, uh, yeah. Obsolescence. Yeah. obsolescence. I'm glad you, you saved me there because I was going to say something like obsolescence or something. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> English is not my first language. Actually, it is, but, uh, uh, and my only language. But um, so I forget what I was going to say then. But uh, uh, but uh, so I, I think that um, I'm more with what Amma said before. The problem with the solar industry is the solar industry has to prove that it can be profitable because solar is not very complicated, particularly if, as you know, we're both. We're both technologically agnostic. Uh, uh, you know, I mean, there's, I'm sure there's high tech in the chemistry and all, but if you're just putting solar panels on a roof or in the California desert, you know, the person that paves your driveway can do that. So the key to me is, is solar plus, and, and I'm admit solar plus storage, which I think is one, but I think there's solar plus a bunch of things. The solar in, embedded in people's life, solar can provide shade, solar can. California should be using its solar power to desalinate water so that they can help get out of their water shortage. There's a, I think there's gotta be much more creativity about what you can use solar with right. uh, than, than focusing too much on technologies that are always 20 to 30 years away, like tidal power, or things like that. I still haven't heard what, what percentage of the world you think is gonna be connected to a grid versus getting their power independently. Just a number. Oh. Um, you know, I, 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 yeah, any, I, I, I would just say I actually do think, um, I do think most of the world will be eventually be connected, but it'll be a lot more interconnection rather than one-way mm -hmm. delivery. And so, uh, you know, I, I couldn't put an exact number on that because okay. I think there's, there's going to be a lot of households formed, particularly in Africa, that just won't go on the grid. It just won't make any sense. Mm -hmm. um, but I also think about places where power is unreliable. You know, when I was, when I was living in Tanzania, I. Um, you know, the power would cut for whole weekends at a time and everything in your freezer and your fridge would melt and, mm -hmm. you know, and so at, at that point, the, it becomes, uh, you change the way you use power. You, you use it when it's available and, and the ability to have battery and solar be your primary power and then use the grid to charge your battery when there's no sun or use the grid when you need to run a kettle or a water yeah. heater at night. That's, I, I think we may see that be a solution for a lot of people at a much lower cost. You know, it's funny, I, I do live without power in, in Africa for, for a year 
which was easier because I knew I never was going to have it, and it was not like I was, it was not a question of unreliability. And I was just speaking to a, a welder the other day in Nigeria who was saying all he really wants is, no, is to know when the power outs are happening. <laughs> Even if he has power only one day a week, that's better than being in the middle of a job and then having something that he can't complete that he has to start all over again because he doesn't know when the power cuts are coming. So, um, Indipri, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, I think um, if you see um, 20 to 30 percent of uh, folks are not um, electrified today and solar makes a lot of sense with battery technology there. So from a numbers perspective, at least for the foreseeable future of 10, 15 years out, you will see at least 20 to 25 percent of these connections to be in microgrids or off-grids. And as technology and, and sources of energy become more efficient, you will probably realize that you, there's no reason for them to be connected with a larger infrastructure, is what my belief is. So I think 20 to 30 percent of the world would not be on the main sort of grid mm -hmm. systems that have been developed you know, many, many years ago. That's, that's my personal belief. Okay, 20 to 30 percent. I was looking for a number. Um, now, just thinking about this, and we are at the State Department, and this is a government-hosted event, of course. Um, how can governments, development finance institutions such as OPIC, um, it, governments in the U.S. Or, or abroad help or hurt? Consistent policy. That's it. No matter what the policy is, just make it consistent. What happens is um, sometimes people or some governments want to have a, a, a smarter solution, they think. But what happened that really rattles investors is at the end, you just need to know what money you're going to make. If you know, you continue to invest, even if it's not great policy, mm -hmm. but you know what it is. When you change it, it really creates chaos. Right. You know, it's interesting. We, um, when a few years ago, after Spain changed its feed-in tariff, mm -hmm. a lot of investors came to us and said that the la lack of predictability of those feed-in tariff levels was the number one thing keeping them up away from investment. So we actually at OPIC introduced a feed-in tariff insurance product. Now the market didn't take it up much, but it was an interesting attempt to levelize and make more predictable those policies which have such a chilling effect on, on investment. Um, other thoughts on what governments could, should be doing or should stop doing uh, in order to encourage more flows of renewable energy? Sure. I think uh, market-driven, something that uh, makes the energy source uh, not driven by subsidy, because that's where you'll see a lot of start stop cycles. Mm -hmm. If you have the budget, if you have the money, then projects happen. If you don't have this stop, and I think that's like even if you have a consistent policy of feed-in tariff, but if there's no money to pay, it doesn't really work. So mm -hmm. driving towards, I think what India has done really well is reverse auctions. So mm -hmm. it's actually a clear path to market-driven uh, power purchase agreements. I think is extremely extremely important uh, for growth. Uh, what they shouldn't do is uh, prescribe technology. So let the IPPs uh, drive the best technology that makes sense in a given situation. Great. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. There was some, um, just taking an example, there was $20 million set aside in Tanzania for scaling up um, renewables, um, and, and we couldn't access a penny of it. And that was because it was prescribed to my small micro hydro projects. Um, so even if you could deliver the same outcomes, you, you couldn't access the funds. And, and no one in the rural electrification agency could could help us get there. Um, I think I think governments are huge catalysts. I mean, especially when you get to markets that become frontier, and there's risk. The risk just accelerates. The currency risk, the operating risk, um, political risk, and and I think that's where institutions like OPIC, um, institutions like USAID, um, really really can can buy down that that risk premium. Because when the risk premium gets too high, then the numbers just stop making sense to, to finance customers. And you have to charge them more, and then you don't get uh, the mass market. So we've been, um, our company and, and others in the sector have been very fortunate to benefit. Um, you, uh, OPIC uh, gave us a grant to subsidize some early stage um, uh, R&D, basically hardware engineering, software engineering, um, business model work to get us ready for the scale where we can accept funding from an institution like that. Um, USAID has put us in the develop, development innovation ventures uh, program and has, excel, has grown their funding alongside venture capital, which is fascinating. So they've actually helped de-risk venture capital investors from coming into our company um, by providing their capital alongside. 
And actually, that grant was coming not from OPEC, from, from the State Department. Oh, that's have, true, and, and the USTDA. So we have the State Department to thank, thank for that. Yes. But what, so, Xavier, when does, a, when does that risk mitigation or that support of the public sector become so much support that it's subsidizing too deeply and competing with your business model? Um, well, I, I think, again, it's all, it's all in the design, right? So, so if we have um, a technology neutral platform, I mean, we've always subsidized electrical infrastructure everywhere. So there's nothing inherently wrong with, with, a, with a subsidy or at least buying down capital. Um, even the US was only, rural areas were electrified in the 50s, primarily with 2% capital that was pushed from, um, from the federal level. Uh, so I think getting cheap capital in these markets is critical to, for all solutions, for microgrids, for home solar, for, um, for anything. And you know, I think the key is, is, again, just avoiding bad policy like subsidizing kerosene is still done in a lot of countries. So how do you compete with, um, I mean, it's a terrible product and it's made more terrible if it's incredibly cheap and puts the consumer in a much harder position to choose. Um, mm -hmm. it's, it's the same thing if, if, if well-intentioned people um, just give away, um, you know, if they're large donation programs. These, uh, these again distort the market in a way that doesn't allow a, a vibrant private sector to, uh, to flourish and grow and build sales and distribution and logistics and yeah. everything you need to actually get this to, to every home. Great, thank you. David, did you have thoughts on this? Well, I mean, the, you know, again, American perspective, you know, oh, you've, the O in OPIC is not relevant to OPIC's world, but I would say actually uh, in the, um, you, you asked more generally about government and looking at the U.S. Uh, I think the situation in the U.S. is to get the government out of the way. Um, but it's, you know, there's a lot of complaints in the, in the U.S. political spectrum about the federal government being unduly interfering in things. But when it comes to home solar in the United States, it's not the federal government at all. It's the state governments and mainly it's the municipalities. I mean, you know, there's no reason a, a cost of a solar panel to me is basically 60 cents a watt. By the time it gets on your roof in suburban Washington, D.C., it's going to be $3.50 to you, and it's going to take me 100 to 120 days to get on your roof and get the local utility to turn it on, which they don't want to do. Uh, so, um, you know, the United States is a consumer-based society that's based on instant gratification. There's almost nothing... If you want to buy something in the United States, there's almost nothing you could buy that would take longer and be a worse experience than getting solar, you know, on your roof. I mean, it's it's the modern day equivalent of waiting for the cable guy. Uh, and but but so and that's mainly because a lot of that cost from 60 cents to 350 is friction cost. You know, waiting for the township engineer to come and you know inspect what you're doing and every municipality in the country does it a different way which makes it makes it very painful so I don't know exactly what the federal government could do it could create a regulatory presumption that people are allowed to put solar in the roof they could come up with some uniform you know solar code or something so there's standard forms and everything so it could all be automated there's you, there's more that we could do but it's basically getting the government out of the way so that people can you know, I've been in the electricity industry for 30 years, and the first product that we've had that, like, my neighbors will actually come up to me and say, you're in the electricity industry? Can I ask you, should I be putting solar on my roof? I'm like, usually what I say, I'm in the electric industry, they're like, uh, you know, hey, what do you think of, you know, the Eagles or something like that? <laughs> so, <laughs> who won last night? So, so we're going to, in a few seconds, we're going to take a, uh, any burning questions uh, from, from the audience. Um, but. And then I'll come back and ask a couple closing ones. But before I do so, I just wanted to, you know, you all are making a very convincing case, and I think everyone in the room is is deeply convinced of the fundamental, uh, of the fundamentals of the re renewable energy business and, and the fact that they've never been stronger. And yet we all know that Wall Street uh, seems to have, as I mentioned earlier, a very short-term approach to things, and long-term decision-making is actually often punished, and there's been some contagion between the oil and gas sector uh, and the renewable energy companies. What do you think about this short-termism on Wall Street, and how is it going to affect your business, and what can we do to convince people of the long-term fundamentals of this business? Interpret. Yeah, so I think you, you really can't change the nature of how the hedge funds operate in the markets. I don't think any of us can, can do that. Um, but what I would encourage investors to think about is, if you are in a market which is underserved from an electricity distribution perspective, if there are limited alternatives that you have, for meeting the energy demand, 
And if you have a consistent and sustainable growth policy plan on the ground, what's the reason for not to invest? Yeah. I just leave it at that. Others? David, Ahmad? Well, look, um, the way um, we convince uh, people to come in is to show them the track record, the consistent cash flows, the no fuel risk, 20-year contracts with uh, counterparties that have great credit rating. And with time, more and more people are coming in. Actually, there's a lot of investment in the space. Mm -hmm. The question is, can we get it at the right uh, cost of capital? Mm -hmm. And uh, our view is, is as time progresses, pension funds, insurance companies will come in in a much larger scale. Because two things are happening, uh, Elizabeth. Number one, the asset has become more transparent. People know what, what it does. Mm -hmm. And also some pension funds and, and others are starting to have their own teams look at this directly. And because of that, that's our own view how it's gonna how it's gonna evolve. Their own teams that are not covering the energy sector but covering renewables separately. Yeah, they understand wind and solar right. uh, pretty well. Right. Thoughts, David? Well, I mean, you know, as a public company CEO, uh, you know, complaining about Wall Street uh, short termism is, uh, you know, is is. You know, it's, Favorite pastime? Uh, yeah. It's, well, no, I mean, you just wake up and you do it before you, while you're brushing your teeth and all that stuff. Well, but, but I mean, I think in our case, because we've been hurt like the rest of the sector, it's, it's not so much uh, short-termism. It's uh, Wall Street's aversion to complexity because, as you said, you know, right. we're, we're both a conventional power company and we're a renewable company. Mm -hmm. And so we're a company in transformation. And, and, uh, and, and that makes, you know, transformation is by necessity complicated. And, and figuring out that conundrum, I think, is important because uh, I think Secretary Kerry alluded uh, to this when he talked about, I think, I think he quoted the statistic that, you know, we're going to spend $17 trillion uh, over the next 10 years on energy. I think I was trying to figure out where that number came from, and I, I'm thinking that's a U.S. domestic number because the annual number worldwide is $6 trillion, and the U.S. is about a third of that. So, so. Um, so what I always say to people is, you know, that if we really care about climate change, I mean, the incumbent forces, the people who run those, uh, those businesses uh, that, that are making that $6 trillion a year, you know, they're not necessarily anti-environment, but they want to protect that $6 trillion. Right. So if you're disrupting their business, they're going to fight back. Right. And so, so I think getting companies, uh, finding a way for companies to transform themselves uh, because renewable energy is obviously the future of the electric industry, and actually no one's denying that, and no one that I come into contact with. It's just how do, you, how do you do it in a smooth path that we have to work out if you're going to rely on public capital. Right. And, and enable investors to have a pure play opportunity in yeah. the renewable space rather than a planned one. Okay, with that, let's, um, let's see if we have a, a, a question or two from, from the audience. I, I can't... <laughs> see out there. I see a hand, but I don't see a face. Yes, please. Is there a microphone that we can bring over here on the right? Thank you. Hello. Can you introduce yourself, please, as well? Is it working? It is. Yes. Yes, I'm Yon Yeti Groglu Capricorn, and I, I took I raised my hand because I didn't see another go up. But um, <laughs> obviously, the the deployment cycle is starting to be extraordinarily interesting. And, um, and I wanted, uh, before I ask the question, by the way, uh, the secretary said, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's important that a few thousand people make some career choices, even if it ruffles feathers. And the four of you clearly have and sometimes ruffled feathers. So that's a really extraordinary thing. Um, so the question is, uh, how do you see the continuing role for, t for new technology? You know, do we have what we need? Uh, and how much better is it going to get? And how important is it that it gets better? I'll, I'll uh, start. Do you want to rephrase the question? It's, 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 yeah. It's, uh, what's the role of new technology, and do we need more? Absolutely, we do. It'll be very short-sighted to think that what we have today is good enough, or because it's going to improve, it's going to be um, comprehensive. There are going to be a lot of innovation that is required for us to evolve, um, especially in storage technology, generation, so on and so forth, even actually in solar, in wind. and uh, and. And I think that's where governments can help a lot because let, let me tell you how I look at it. Universities bring ideas. Um, VCs take some of those ideas after they developed somewhat 
to take bets on them. They invest in 10 companies, two of them make it. And then some companies ramp it, some companies sustain it, some companies end of life it. There's a bridge though in national labs that is not being funded well enough. You know, like example ARPA-E, what DARPA used to do. So those areas, I think that's where we need a bridge uh, to intensify the idea generation to VC land. There's that development cycle where you have to really spend money uh, that is not happening as much and in the same intensity. And that can be done in any country, by the way. Other thoughts? Well, I would, I would say I, I think there's still a ton of innovation on the software side of all of this as this increasingly moves to deployment, uh, credit risk assessment, um, management of, of distributed customer bases, um, even management of currency risk across, across countries. Um, some of this becomes a software problem as, as well as a hardware problem. And I think it's also the, the difference between uh, David's 60 cents and $3.50. Uh, some of that will be innovated away in inverters. It will be innovated away in, uh, in cheaper batteries. And it'll also be innovated in, in efficiency business models that um, can swap out LED lights and, and uh, you know, share the savings uh, really throughout the world. Okay, other questions? I see a number of hands now. Um, all the way in the back. Thank you. Um, my name is Peter Sweetman. Um, I run a firm called Climate Strategy and Partners. Um, Secretary Kerry introduced the idea that energy efficiency was one of the low-hanging fruit. And as private sector business managers, um, uh, the IEA believes that 50% uh, of the pathway to, to the two-degree scenario will come through energy efficiency investments. So it's low-hanging fruit and as important to the energy transition as it is. Um, I'm of the impression that perhaps some, sometimes businesses find investing in something that doesn't exist or a saving is perhaps harder than investing in a power producing asset. Is that the case in your experience and, and what are the, the new promising business models for energy efficiency? That's a great question, Peter. Thank you. Well, I, I, I think there is a fundamental problem with relying too much on en energy efficiency in, cons in consumer based societies as consumer based societies usually pay for consumption and, and no one's yet found the perfect model to finance uh, something that where you're asking someone not to do something and I also think that as I said in a in a in an age of immediate gratification you know asking people not to do things uh, you know doesn't work that well unless you're in Japan where they you know Fukushima happens and they they cut their electricity demand by 30 percent uh, you know we can do that in this country I don't think so but I mean, I think the key, first of all, is I think energy efficiency conservation has to be automated so people don't have to think about it. Lives are complicated. Uh, no one wants to, you know, I mean, just like my father followed around my sisters and I turning off lights at, at night, the last thing I do before I go to bed every night is go around the house and turn off 15, you know, lights. There's no reason I should have to do that, you know, walking around the house. And I'm sure there's some houses in California where you don't have to do it. It all happens automatically. but. But I think that where you're going to see efficiency and conservation work is basically in business to business because one of the great things, and the, the administration has really helped with this, is that every big business wants to embrace clean energy as part of their core values and people are making statements and um, as the president of Georgetown said in the last thing, buying a renewable energy credit is not enough anymore. That's, that's old school. So if you're serving big customers now, the best way to work energy conservation efficiency is, is go in and take over their energy management and say, look, and so you're basically bundling the energy efficiency and conservation with a smart system with solar on the roof. And, and if, you, if you package it all together, and so I put it back in the category of solar plus, then I think you can finance it and make a lot of headway. But, you know, just going around conservation efficiency, the, the only people that can do that, pay people not to do things, is the government. You know, it's, a, it's an interesting point because in our business model, we actually don't charge per kilowatt hour. We, we charge a flat monthly uh, fee. And so I think our customers probably buy 90% efficiency and 10% power from us if I were to have to, have to gauge it. Um, and there may, be, there may be some lessons there. Um, I, I think what David's describing for businesses isn't that different where they know what they pay today and if they could pay less and get the same or more. Right. Um, yeah. I think a lot of businesses would, would sign up for that. Right. Thank you. Other questions? May I join Shulik Dave on this? 
Sure. Can you join what? I wanted to join the issue with Dave on what he just said. Okay. About uh, it being difficult to get consumer-driven societies to focus on energy conservation. In the U.S., he said. Uh, uh. More particularly in the U.S. <laughs> and I was walking this morning outside the White House, and all the street lights were on at 8 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> I think that that's very serious concern when we go into Paris and we are trying to tell the developing countries to focus on their responsibility for uh, clean climate or greenhouse gas uh, uh, reduction. I think it's equally important consumerism will also have to be addressed. What you just said about switching off the lights, I did that yesterday in my hotel room. I don't know if we are as a nation willing to look at this kind of waste and what that implies. Mm -hmm. After all, you may add as much renewable energy as you want. The silica chips are going to be manufactured somewhere. They're going to be transported by diesel or petrol driven vehicles. They're going to be set up. All of this is going to consume electricity. So I don't think there is a justification that we can consume and waste electricity and then tell the rest of the world that, look, we have a right to waste electricity mm -hmm. because we are rich. And somebody else has to pay for it and reduce his consumption of electricity. Well, and, and just to tell you the difference between you and me, I mean, I go to a hotel room, I turn on all the lights and turn the air conditioning on full blast because I'm trying to sell electricity. So, uh, <laughs> so I mean, that's, 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 that's what the capitalist system tells me to do. So <laughs> I'll even go to the next person's room. <laughs> Sorry, I was just kidding, but just a little bit. <laughs> One more thought, thoughts here? Yes, please, sir. Um, I'm Eric McCartney, and um, I run a, uh, a renewable, or I should say, um, advisory um, um, company that uh, focuses on um, producing or, or helping developers develop uh, projects in developing markets such that um, they are more bankable and so they can access financing. My primary focus is in Africa, and my question, and, and I'd like to echo what Secretary um, Kerry actually said about it's not a, a U.S. problem, it is a global problem, and, and more so even in, in, in a way in what um, Xavier did in, in Tanzania is quite admirable because I see what goes on in Africa and the access to electricity and the problems that, that go on with that. Um, but, and, and it's also admirable because of scale, and that's my question. My encounter in many situations in Africa is, is that the grids are not the size that we speak about in other countries and certainly nowhere near the size that we have here in the U.S. Many countries have four or five hundred megawatts total for an entire country. Question is, how do we attract investment into those countries on a smaller scale? Because my experience has been that larger companies, and no offense to the panel that is up there, are not looking at 20 megawatt projects. They want 100 megawatts. They want 200 megawatts. Yeah, I'll, I'll say one thing. So we looked at Nigeria uh, two years ago. We did actually had a full team, looked at it top to bottom. Had 170, 180 million people population. They have 12 gigawatts installed, six operational, two and a half utilized. And our reaction is, you know what, if, if world-class companies the last 30, 40 years couldn't figure it out, we have to be careful. So the way we're dealing with it is through rural electrification. And we have actually, Kathy Zoe is here, she's the CEO of Frontier, San Edison Frontier Power. And our view is, is with that we can have significant impact and make money while not doing the big projects. Because big projects require a lot of investment. And I would rather count on the population than a regime in, in that regard. So that's how we're dealing with it as a big company. And if I may just add to that, I think when you see a lot of goals coming out of emerging markets in terms of megawatts, if you look at the implementation at the ground level, they don't necessarily have to be like really large projects at a single location. You can actually build them in a distributed fashion where you actually need 
energy. So I think that's a great model that I believe that in Africa will also work. So if you need to build these projects, you can build them in a distributed fashion all over Africa. And what you do need is the ability to finance an aggregated pool of assets, which I think a lot of banks now understand how to underwrite and finance. And I think OPEC's done a great job in underwriting some of those facilities for us in the past as well. In Africa, one of the biggest challenges also is government, like it's already been addressed. And, and one of the things that we can't do is, is the government prevents the private sector from investing on these type of projects. For instance, in Senegal, um, the only person who can sell power is the public utility. So we, as an IPP, couldn't go in and create a rural electrification. So it is a, a government issue as well. Um, and that, Education, I think, yeah. is the best solution, but how do we get there? Yeah. I, I would say certainly in, in OPIC's business, we see that the lack of trust between the private sector developers and the government is one of the key hindrances holding investment back. Um, you know, governments, on the one hand, lack, sometimes lack the political will, the execution capability to take the tough decisions to award those concessions to charge, you know, to allow cost-covering tariffs. On the flip side, you know, there have been some inequities in, and developers have in the past taken advantage of information asymmetries and governments have regretted decisions that they've made. So there's suspicion going both directions. But I certainly hear from all of our clients that the lack of political will and execution capability um, is, the, is the single thing holding, holding back the most development uh, of renewable energy on the continent. Do you all have any, any reaction to that question? And, and, and no, that? I, I, think it's, I think it's such a great question and um, just had a couple thoughts. So one is um, we, we partnered up with the government of Tanzania with, on, on a million solar homes plan over the next uh, three years or so. Um, and I, I really do believe that public-private partnership here is the, is the way forward. Um, I think some of this is just a lack of mis is mistrust. I mean, there are definitely some governments that, that are just inept or, or corrupt, and, but, I, but I don't think that's the majority. And I actually think a lot of them maybe just need the case in a little, made in a little clearer way. I mean, our case to the president of Tanzania was not climate change, it was jobs. Mm -hmm. This is solar industry creates jobs, burning kerosene doesn't create jobs. As, that was the fundamental point. Um, and fundamental point number two is, hey, you, when you do build power, I, I expect you probably want it to go to your major cities and power your industry. And it's, uh, it's quite expensive to run a line to every last rural household. Um, but it's a huge voter issue. I mean, voters want power. There are countries that will lay down the poles alongside the road before an election to make sure that they, they, they get reelected and <laughs> they won't actually put in the power. Let's pick them back up for the, for the next cycle. Um, so this is, there's incredible political will here to, to do this sort of thing. I think, uh, I think it just needs to be proven a little bit. And I think um, aggregating assets is, is so important. And, and I mean, that's our entire business model. We, we succeed or fail if we can convince people that 100,000 um, small rural households paying reliably looks kind of like one big power plant. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, you mentioned sort of Paris, and I just wanted to see if any of you have particular hopes, aspirations, or advice for Secretary Kerry uh, as we look at the road to Paris? I think, you know, we have to really partner with developing countries and not have the view that they have to do a lot of work and we don't. I think, you know, so what, what he said is, is extremely important. And, but at the same time, also, we need to help these countries because a lot of times they, want, they have the will, but they don't have the money. Mm -hmm. And we can help them with foreign exchange risk, so on and so forth, where the cost of renewables become extremely competitive with other sources. Because at the end, people need jobs. They need to develop their economy. And to go and talk about climate change when there no, there's not enough investment in, in power and so on and so forth and to, to create those jobs, it will be very untenable, even for someone who cares deeply. So I think that's where we have to go hand in hand. We can't ask for people to do something that we're not willing to do. Mm -hmm. Other thoughts? Well, I mean, I think the, the two points, that if I had Secretary Kerry's here, I would say, first of all, this issue of, okay, you have to embrace renewables rather than do the cheaper thing, which is fossil fuel. It's, it's, it's a false premise mm -hmm. as we sit here in 2015. I mean, you know, utility scale uh, 
you know, bidding in um, the last utility scale bid in Austin, Texas, you know, the, the low bidder was four cents per kilowatt hour for solar and wind is, goes for two to three, even with gas at $3 per million BTU. I mean, the price of renewable energy is competitive with the price of fossil fuels. So the idea that there needs to be a mass transfer of wealth, which I think is politically untenable in a lot of parts of the world, is not, is, it shouldn't be on, on the thing. And, and the second thing, which I'm admit, is jobs. I mean, I was just thinking about, I mean, distributed solar in particular is a huge local job creator. I mean, if you look at NRG's 50,000 megawatts right now, our total number of megawatts that are distributed on people's homes is something like 0.5% of that. But our home solar workforce is 15% of our mm -hmm. total. We've gone from you know sort of zero to 1,500 people in uh, two years. Right. And uh, it's a very, very labor intensive thing. And the jobs are local and they're spread out evenly. And that applies in any country of the world. And that's what every public policymaker wants now, right, is jobs. Right. So Indipreet, India is obviously a huge, uh, a huge part of the solution here. What do you hope to see coming out of Paris? You know, I, I'd say like even outside of these commitments uh, at, in Paris and Kyoto earlier, if you see what India has announced in the last 12 to 18 months, is phenomenal. Uh, 100,000 megawatts of solar by year 2022, 75,000 megawatts of wind power, I mean, this would make India one of the largest, if not the largest, yeah. market for renewable energy in the world outside of these negotiations. So I think, as everyone else pointed out, it's extremely complicated subject, way beyond my purview or my expertise. But all I'd say is that economic development in emerging countries has to be kept in mind when any of these targets and commitments are being negotiated because at the end of the day, if the basics are not being met, It'll be very, very hard for climate change matters to be addressed in these economies. So we're coming to a, a, a close here. And what I'd love to do is tee off of a speech. I know, Ahmad, you made a, a speech in Boston, a very inspirational speech to a group of the next generation of uh, climate and energy entrepreneurs. And I'd just like to ask each of you to wrap up by letting us know, and then I've got one more question at the end, but to wrap up by telling us what do you think the next generation is going to do uh, in terms of solving the problems that we're leaving behind? And what does the uh, landscape of clean energy look like in, say, 2025? We looked, we looked at the biggest surprises going looking backwards. What do you see looking ahead? So I'll, I'll start. Um, so first of all, th what I'm going to say probably is going to create even more problems politically and so on in the Excellent. long run. Okay, good. We're looking forward <laughs> there, to that. There are two things going to happen in, in, in automotive industry. Number one, today there's a billion vehicles, the investment is 35 trillion, yet it's, cars are utilized only 4% of the time, including when you sit in traffic. It's a, if you talk about 50% efficiency improvement, we're talking about 96% efficiency improvement. So that's number one statistic. The second statistic is, is actually nice and, and it's going to transform the oil industry. Lithium-ion batteries are improving at 7% per year in density. That means for the same size battery that today drives 250 miles with no recharge, in 10 years, it will drive 500 miles. Who will drive an oil-driven car if you have a 500-mile range with a $30,000 car in the United States? No one would do it. And I think that will disrupt the markets in a significant way. And I'm, that's why I said, watch out. Because pension funds who have invested trillions of dollars in fossil fuels, they have to pay their pensioners. Mm -hmm. Countries have to pay their bills. Corporations, employment. So that for me is going to be the interesting thing to see how it evolves over time. Very interesting. Thank you. Others? What's the picture look like in 2025? Well, I mean, you, you started the question by saying, you know, when, uh, what would you say to the future entrepreneurs or what Ahmad said? But I would say, you know, one technology that we haven't talked about here that is essential that be developed. And, you know, when I go to engineering schools, I say, who wants to be an engineer? All of you, because you're in engineering school and want to make a billion dollars in your life and save the world. And uh, we, have, we have to, given the, 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 the infrastructure that exists, we have to figure out carbon capture because the, the existing big fossil fuel plants are not going away between here and now and 2050. They're not going to be legislated away. So, 
So I always say to people that, you know, if you want to work on one technology, uh, that would be the thing to do. But, I mean, for me, how will the world look like? And again, American perspective, and I alluded to the sort of cable TV example in 2025. What really fascinates me is that in the United States where the home solar business is just beginning, I mean, the biggest player, I think, is, I, I haven't seen their latest projection, but they're doing 180,000 a year in a, in a market that's perceived to be somewhere between 35 and 55 million homes, is that, that the home solar, the 20-year lease arrangement uh, becomes the backbone to a 20-year energy relationship with the American consumer in the same way when everyone first put cable TV in their house, it was so that they could watch cable TV. Mm -hmm. Right now, two-thirds of your cable bill in the United States is for, for data. No one watches cable TV anymore, but everyone's still paying yeah. you know, the cable TV bill because they're doing other things off their, off their cable backbone. Uh, I'm, I'm fascinated by the idea that the home solar 20-year relationship could, could have all these other things built on it, whether it be the electric car charging or the energy efficiency in the house, the, you know, the smart meters and, and all that. And, right. and so I think that's, it's, it's going to be a change in the nature of the relationship with the energy consumer. That's very interesting. You know, two, two thoughts on this. Uh, I think one, one is I would, going 10 years out, I would say a quarter of homes in the world will have a lithium battery in, in the home, whether that's in the form of an electric car or whether that's in the form of an off-grid solar system like ours or something, uh, something in the middle. It just makes so much sense in so many contexts. And increasingly, those will be um, connected as well. And so you'll be able to do things like demand response, where you can flip a bunch of people over to battery uh, when it's needed and actually make, uh, make revenue that way. Um, I also think we'll probably see the first solar uh, country. It, it may actually happen well before that, but we will see a number of countries where there are well more people getting their power from solar on their roof than, uh, than there are from the grid. I think that will be really powerful. Just go ahead. So I think uh, there's going to be a big shift in consumers driving the source of energy that they want to procure rather than utilities telling them what source of energy you actually get. And that's also going to change with consumers' lifestyle being so integrated with solar technology, just the way it is with cell phones and Wi-Fi right now. I mean, you're going to have your cell phone screens with solar panels. You're going to have school backpacks with solar panels. You're going to have a car garage port system with solar panels. You're going to have an electric vehicle that gets charged with solar. I believe every individual will be touched by solar in 2025. One other sort of anecdotal uh, thing that I'd like to mention, in 2010, India's solar um, policy required four units of uh, coal power to be blended with one energy of solar power to be sold to the utilities uh, from an economics perspective. I think by 2025, it'll be the other way around, where you'd have four units of solar power being bundled with one unit of coal to make it make, it make coal more, more financially attractive. <laughs> Great. So in closing, gentlemen, um, I would love to have uh, your favorite fact on what's exciting or scary about the transition to a low carbon economy. I'll offer up my two. One scary one is that uh, there's more diesel generators today in Nigeria than there are people. I stole that from you, Xavier. <laughs> and the hopeful one, of course, is that Africa's added more, uh, more power, renewable energy in the last year than, than the 14 years combined. What's your favorite fact? Xavier, I'll start with you. Um, well, my, my favorite one is that there's actually more people um, without electricity today than in Edison's time when, when the first light bulb was turned on. <laughs> And so that just gives you a sense of both the inequality of wealth and also um, the, um, as po the population growth primarily of Africa and, and, and India and how distributed that is and how hard it is to reach every one of those people with the grid. Right. Very tweetable, very tweetable that one. <laughs> <laughs> Others, David? Yeah, well you used to, so I'll use to. And again, I'm sorry, but there are two American facts, but they are demographic facts. I mean, everyone knows that the millennial generation, 80 million strong in the United States is the largest generation in American history, but often they're derided by the fact that they don't have any money. Well, within two years, uh, their purchasing power is supposed to exceed the purchasing power of the baby boomer generation. And, and we have to tell people, you know, we're not offering a product right now in the American electricity sector that millennials can relate to. My second one is that with respect to the next generation, which I think may be called centennials, the people below baby boom generation, so under the age of 10, the 
Average age of a first time owner of a cell phone in the United States right now is six years old. 56% of American children have a, a cell phone before their seventh birthday. Wow. And those people expect their power to be portable. So. Um, wow, that's good. Wow. Online to degree. So uh, I think uh, there are about uh, 1.3 billion people that don't have access to electricity. I think we all know that. Um, by 2030, I think you'll still have a billion without because you'll probably be adding power for about 1.7 billion in the same time frame, mm -hmm. but you will have to catch up with the increase in population. I actually believe by 2030, you'll have more solar panels than people on the planet. Mm -hmm. Nice. Great. My most interesting one is um, in India, there's 28 million water pumps, grid connected and diesel. They're equivalent to around 125 gigawatts, if you convert them, mm -hmm. three or five, five horsepower uh, uh, solar water pumps. And the, the, the relationship of that with the farmer is not very effective because people don't know when to get uh, electricity, so they over pump water. Mm -hmm. And in some places like Rajasthan, there's like dark areas in the water table. And if you are able to convert that, to not only eliminate around 10, or more billion dollar subsidy that the government gives, it eliminates over pumping of water. And at the same time, you can do some net metering scheme where the farmer now, whether there's good weather or not, will have an income over the next 30 years. So that's for me is, is the most that's powerful great. thing that we can do. Great. Well, thank you, gentlemen. It has been a privilege to share the stage with you. You are all one of the most, some of the most powerful vectors driving the transformation of our global economy into one that is based on a lower carbon future, transforming that economy from one that is inefficient, unsustainable, polluting, and excludes the majority of the population to one that is cleaner, more sustainable, more efficient, and more inclusive, therefore making a more just and secure world. So thank you very much for all that you're doing, and thank you all for participating. Thank you.